Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the conference so far. My name is Zainab. I'm a senior data scientist at TomTom Tom and a proud committee member of uh, PyData Eindhoven. Uh, I'm here in the studio together with my co-host, Dimitra. Uh, she's a data scientist at ASML and she's going to support us uh, remotely from home. And uh, we are kicking off the afternoon session with a special uh, Q&A with Corinne Vigro. Uh, I know most of you uh, may know Corinne, but for a proper introduction to her, she is uh, a co-founder of TomTom Tom and uh, founder of CODAM, a free programming school in, um, in Amsterdam. Uh, she's an amazing role model and a successful woman in tech. And as PyData committee, we are so proud to have her uh, here in the event. Within the next 25, 30 minutes, we are going to chat about her journey to uh, the tech world, CODAM, future of education and open source. Please use the Q&A chat box to um, put your questions there. We try our best to answer all your questions. But let's uh, start with Corinne. Hello, Corinne. Uh, thank you so much for joining. We are happy to have you here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Every time I can fly the women in technology flag, you know, I'm very happy to be able to do that. Uh, we are so excited to have you here. So as I think as a first uh, and I think natural questions and something that we are all wondering, you have co-founded TomTom 30 years ago. What, uh, how did you get to where you are here? Please take us to your journey. Right, I'll do that quickly because, you know, 30 years is a very, very long time. I know I don't yeah, look it, but uh, it's a long time. So I started in, uh, I come from a little suburb outside Leo and some of my friends started a games company that uh, was called Infogram that became um, to be Atari later on. And uh, I started there within a week, they sent me to London and I arrived in London in 86 and tech was booming in the computer game industry. And that's kind of how I fell into it. Um, fast forward a few years later, I joined a company called Scion and, uh, in 87, and Scion was the precursor of, uh, you can imagine, the beginning of the mobile phones without data connectivity. They were doing handheld computers, so you could do a lot of things in the palm of your hand. Joined that company and I just got the bug. Tech is about innovating, it's about solving problems, it's about going fast, making decisions, having impact. And when a few years later, I had the opportunity to join a more traditional company, which I did when I moved to Holland, uh, I only stayed for six months because I missed that uh, what technology, that vibe that I had seen both at uh, Infogram and then at Scion. So after six months in a more traditional industry, um, I uh, decided that uh, I needed to get back into technology. And I joined a couple of guys who were making some software for those famous handheld computer. And so... Uh, where TomTom Tom started, it was called PalmTop Software. And that was in 92. Uh, um, and at the beginning, we were just doing software. We were, do, we were doing software for those handheld computers. You can imagine 92, uh, no, uh, you know, no Windows, no, uh, in terms of Microsoft Windows. Um, there was uh, still, uh, internet was in its infancy. There was no ma email. There was, everything was, very, very uh, early on in the process. And we, our role was to put uh, computers in the hand of, of blue collar workers who were doing meter reading application. So we were very good at making uh, user interface very simple. And that's how we started. We made broader application. And in 95, we came across a navigation product for the PC. And we thought, wow, that's weird. Why would you want to have navigation on your PC? You want navigation in your car. That's when you need it. Otherwise, you need to print it. You need to take in your car. What happens if you miss a turn? Of course, it wasn't ideal. So, so imagine if we could program our little devices with navigation. Everybody told us it was not possible. You can imagine at the time, the maximum memory we had was uh, 256K and then 512. You know, that was what we had available. We didn't have one megabyte. Uh, nothing would fit on it. So we became known for how good we could compress data. And, uh, and the rest is history. We, we started making software for those handheld computers. And we could see that even so, it wasn't... Uh, you, you needed to download a city at the time. You only had routes between big cities. 
this was overselling anything else we were doing in terms of software. So we thought, hey, we want to do something. This is solving a problem. Why don't we push this further and put everything in one box? And the, the, the brief we gave the developers is you buy that box in the shops, you put it in your car, and you navigate home. No need to connect it to a computer. We wanted to make it really easy. Technology in the, in the hands of people who don't understand technology, but that still solve a real purpose. And we sold from zero to one million. We went faster than a mobile phone. That meant also that uh, the need for this type of device was, was huge. And uh, that's where the company uh, really started going and growing really fast. So between 92 and 2004, we were hovering between 40 and 50 people. And then we went from 40 million turnover to 1.8 billion. And, you know, there was no stopping us. It was a whole other story, but, uh, but that's a journey. So it's a journey of starting in, uh, in the computer games industry, in falling completely in love with technology. Uh, for a long time, I was the only woman, but I didn't even notice. We were, we were a team together. We were kind of making, changing the world a little bit. Uh, there was a huge amount of energy. And, uh, and here we are, fast forward, uh, uh, 2020 and then uh, yeah TomTom -tom is still uh, having a big impact so I'm very proud of that. Well that's so inspiring I think um, I, I've heard this story from different people you know how TomTom -tom started and how, how we get here but it's always inspiring to hear it from you. Um, so you have over these years you have seen um, several companies how um, they have changed and how this tech world has has been changing and uh, so my next question for you is that what do you think in your opinion is the biggest challenge that the tech companies are facing right now and the tech for the tech world is facing right now so I think there's quite a few to be honest first of all that I, as a European tech leader I couldn't tell you that I was not worried about the dominance in technology from people on either side of us, uh, namely the um, America and Asia. T technology is everywhere. It's everywhere in the way we interact. It's everywhere in the way we consume news. It, it, it's everywhere. And I think the, the, what's important is uh, technology sometimes has a bad name. People are saying, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take jobs. Well, actually, I think it creates a lot of new opportunities. Uh, people are saying, but it's doing bad things. Well, actually, it's doing a lot of good stuff. You look at the, at, at the use of, of new technology, and uh, if you look at AI and the, the, the impact it will have in mobility, in, in medicine, of course, it has some potential negative side, but there's so many good that can be taken out of it. We just need to make sure it's done the proper way. What worries me is when you write the future, when you're in technology, that cannot be one type of people who write that future. So I am concerned about the fact that it's a, still a very male-dominated environment. And uh, I'd like to see many more type of diversity. And I mean, of course, gender diversity, but cultural diversity, uh, socioeconomic diversity. The, the world of tomorrow is being written as we speak, and we need a big diverse group to do that. So I think technology is a force for good. Uh, it needs to be, we need to have rules and regulations like we've had for years everywhere else to make sure that uh, the power of technology is not being abused. And I think governments can do that. And you see that the regulators is jumping onto that with the GDPR that we have in, in Europe. There are a minimum of, of framework we need to operate. But the, the, the power of technology of solving a lot of our daily problem is, is huge. And I have a big appeal for making Europe bigger so we can really also play a role. If you're, not, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and that's, we don't want to be used in Europe as well. Uh, we, we want to be an active player and, uh, and it's nice to see a lot of actually FinTech company doing well in Europe. We need to have a broader range of technology company being active and I want much more diversity. Mm -hmm. Well, you actually mentioned one of the things that I'm um, personally passionate about and I care about, uh, about gender diversity. So it's no secret that we don't have enough women in tech. But what do you think are going to be active steps to change this? Well, I think what you're doing, Zainab, today will change things. 
the fact that you're there on stage, that you explain what you're doing, that you are you give other women a platform, that makes a difference. You you yeah you you want to see what you want to become, and I think it is important that that all of us women in technology, and there are many. I've got many uh, women friends uh, that uh, all over Europe that are playing big roles in technology. They're being recognized by Forbes or Inspiring 50. So we we need to have a voice, and that is the reason why when you ask me to speak, I said yes, just just to show that it's it is a it is a fun world. Um, also, the, the idea that technology is, uh, you know, you need to be good at math and you need, well, in data science, it's better if you're good at math and statistics, but in, in technology in general, in, in, in coding, in software engineering, you just need to be creative. And I think technology is open to, to everyone. And if you look at the profile I have at Codam, I've got people who studied uh, art history or studied music. So it's a very diverse group of people. So back to your question, how do we make this more appealing? First of all, we open the Pandora box of stereotypes. It is not what people think it is. We need to educate the public, young students, even early students when they are teenagers about how much impact they can have, especially girls and boys, but girls as well, the impact they can have. The fact that the jobs that will be created by the tech world will give them a, a, you know, a nice source of income and they can do something that's meaningful to them. Uh, they can work on climate change, they can work on energy, they can work on transport, they can work in the medical field. There's so many fields. So what I think we need to do is, is get women to speak. Um, they're everywhere. You know them, they are Tom Tom as well. It's a, we just need to give them a platform. We just need to make sure they are confident enough to go and speak. And that's what we do at Codam. Uh, we bring a lot of women speakers, either in cybersecurity or in their field of interest. Um, what I like about women in technology is women we tend, and I don't want to stereotype, but when we do something, we, we tend to want to have impact. We tend to want to uh, change things for the better. We want to create a better world for our children. I'm not saying men don't want that, but I think us as women, as mothers, we probably want that more than anyone. If you combine that and give us the tools and the means to actually do it through technology, that's immensely powerful. And that's what I think that women who are working in those fields, who are having this type of impact. You probably saw last night the Nobel Prize that was given to two women for the first time with their discovery in, um, for, for, in medicine. So I think we're getting there bit by bit. And we should look through our organization, our companies, and make sure we pull all those women that sometimes are working silently because you know they don't have the confidence to step up and say, look, you could be someone like that and you could have a lot of fun in the process. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I think we should create the community that makes that empowers um, all people from uh, underrepresented groups, women, uh, to, to be confident, to step up and um, take this stage. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You, uh, you mentioned CODAM, and uh, I, I think most of us uh, who are um, now doing the programming, we learned a, um, a, a programming language either as a course uh, in the university or college or self-training. So I don't remember, um, I've, I've I've never heard of any uh, dedicated programming school. Uh, what was the reason that you started uh, CODAM and how its uh, educational philosophy is different from regular education? Well, actually, in, in 2005, it all started, it was a long journey. I, I set up a foundation which was aimed at, uh, at, at equal opportunity and education. I wanted to, to mix the two. So for a long time, I look at uh, association and NGOs that were working in this field. So basically combining uh, education and equal opportunities. And I came across the 42 school in Paris that was set up by Xavier Niel, who is a big telecom entrepreneur in France. And what struck me in that school was that you could, anybody could get there. You, you, it didn't matter what you had done before. I mean, you know, as teenagers and especially in today's world with the pressure and the environment, sometimes young people just get off the rail, 14, 15. But in our current education system, if that happens, 
it's written. You, you cannot, it's very difficult to then go to university. And in Holland, if you haven't done FEVEO, it, it is difficult. If you haven't done the, then you can do ABO and then go back. But it, it doesn't, it's not easy to, to if, if you're going to, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you're not ambitious. It just means that at that age, the stars were not aligned or you had to face something. So I, I'm very worried that the current education system is a bit too rigid for the current world we live in. That was one. Number two is um, I could see a lot of kids who also didn't, uh, um, didn't manage to, to exploit or to maximize their potential because they were not coming from the right areas, because they didn't have access to university, because they didn't know uh, what they wanted to do existed. And what I like about 42 is uh, you could go in, you just needed to do the online test and they didn't care what you had done before. The other thing is I know that software engineers are in big demand. You can see at some time how difficult it is for us to recruit. We tend to go and put offices next to university. That's why we started offices in Poland and in, in Belgrade. And so I said, well, that's crazy because we've got all those kids that fall off the bandwagon that are, you know, have got a lot of potential. At the same time, we've got a big gap in software engineering and coders. Uh, we need them because we, we, the, the world software is ruling the world. And Xavier had put the two together and he had created this school where basically uh, anybody could get in and you could learn to program. And what I liked about it, it was peer-to-peer -peer learning. So you were learning to learn. And you know, you, you know you, it's not about which programming language you're learning, it's where you find the information to solve the problem. So software engineering is about solving a problem. And you also know that there are various ways of doing that. And that school actually, you needed to learn from each other and you needed to learn to learn. And that learn to learn that soft skills is the most important soft skills for the future. The world is going at such a pace that we all have to keep learning. As I told you at the beginning of my journey, I think the first time I saw a computer was the Commodore 64 of my brother when I was 20, and I had cassette tapes. Can you imagine all the way where we are now talking about you know, machine learning and deep learning and using all this uh, technology to, uh, to do our computer vision and our maps. I had to learn, I had to keep learning. I'm not saying I'm going to be a big uh, ML engineer tomorrow, but at least I understand the, the basics and the fundamentals. So for all my career, I've had to keep learning. And I think having, uh, encouraging students early on to be curious, to keep learning, to understand the need to adapt to the world, that's very important. So that school was ticking all the boxes. It was open to everyone. It would form software engineers, which the world need desperately, uh, and therefore give people a chance to participate in, in the economic progress uh, of, of society. And they was insisting on the soft skills that are so important to anyone. So I contacted them. I said, look, I'd love to do this in Holland. Uh, can you give me a license to your curriculum? And it looks like I wasn't the only one because now you have 34 schools in the network uh, sponsored by various uh, organizations like the Telefonica Foundation in Spain, uh, like um, Ilka Ipanen, who is the, the founder of Supercell in, in Finland. So other entrepreneurs or foundations that are focused on education have basically bought that school and that curriculum to their country. So, 34 schools in as many countries, uh, nearly, there's a three or four in France, um, opening really this new type of education. And the good news is, uh, just now I just find out, we, are, we did our three months of selection. Uh, we've just selected 106 students, it's our new cohort. 41% are women, 41%. And no positive discrimination. So it shows as well that that what we've done is we brought people like you, people like the, the, the young women to talk to our students at CODAM. Well, thank you, it's worked. It inspired other women. And now we've got 41% of women. It's a bit of a scoop because I just got the, minutes, the, the, the numbers two minutes ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm so proud of the team and of all of you that helped us inspire young women to join CODAM. And, uh, and again, Completely blind selection, so no positive discrimination. 41% of women in the next CODAM cohort. Well, Corinne, that's amazing to hear. 
uh, actually, the, this um, like a couple of months ago, I had an intern um, uh, from Kodam, and uh, he was very passionate and he was really into enthusiastic about learning machine learning and data science, which actually inspired me. And I've learned from him a lot. It was like it should it should have been the other way around, but uh, I, I I've learned a lot from him as well. Um, I wanted to ask you, but because most of the, our audience are data scientists and people who are uh, working in data science field, uh, I want to ask you what role CODAM plays in, um, in, in data science field and is there any programs in place to encourage students or uh, does the student show interest uh, to join uh, this field of data science machine learning? Yes, absolutely. I think you can, again, to, 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 you don't know what you don't know. So those students, uh, their world is getting bigger by you people coming to talk to them about your jobs, what you do on a daily basis. We encourage our students to use open source software. Um, they uh, deposit their software on GitHub. And the advantage is when they go somewhere, someone can just have a look at their code and understand the code. It's, uh, they can read it, they can understand it. So I think this, uh, I think, you know, in the future, and you see it also the way we recruit, you don't going to, if you recruit a software engineer, you're not going to really look at their CVs or where they've gone. You're going to look at their code and you look at what they've been using, where they find the information, the quality of the code, how they got to solve the problems. So I think this is, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan and, uh, and Codam is definitely encouraging that to get people to work on projects using open source software. Okay, that's then. That's great. Then that's very uh, <clears throat> nice. So um, uh, my question and uh, my next question is that how open source community can learn from Kodam and its philosophy, the way you are um, you are educating the students. Well, I think the open source community is already a community of people contributing to to uh, to something. The whole it's it's a community based, huh? so everybody is is using open source software, contributing back to it. And I think the philosophy of Codam is the same. We we want people to learn with each other, to solve problems with each other, to to actually contribute to that uh, to that community in the same way. We encourage them to do that, and I think that's. Uh, that's the future of, of technology. Yeah? That's, it's the problem we're solving are so complex that if everybody all over the world are contributing to a, to a core, and I think we we'll see what happened with, with Linux and, and other big, uh, big platforms, I think that's, uh, that's definitely the future. And I, uh, I, would, uh, I would encourage that. Again, it's not my area of expertise, but I can see the, the benefit of it. And it's something we definitely uh, encourage in our, in our student community and I think that's, uh, you can see the, the popularity of open source software. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's unstoppable and that's, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, regarding the future, how do you see the future of uh, education and also yeah, in, the, uh, uh, in the regard to, uh, to open source? How do you think that it's going to change in future, in your opinion? Yeah, again, it's, I think education needs to, to change anyway. I, th I think the, the way, I, for what I've said earlier as well, the, the way we are organized, the way we're teaching kids, we are not rewarding the right things. We're not rewarding creative thinking. We're not rewarding uh, leadership skills. So we, all those soft skills uh, are, are so important and you can see that yourself in your work environment. Mm -hmm. So I think to encourage people to be curious, to look at what's available, it, it's no point reinventing the wheel. Look at the tools tools, look at what's available, look at what's been done already, use that and then contribute to that. I think everybody can build on each other's effort. I think that's the future and that would help us accelerate uh, discovery, progress and innovation. Uh, and I think we're all going to, you know, if the community works with each other using uh, open source software. Uh, I'm hoping that this will accelerate innovation and make uh, yeah, and, and get us to where we uh, solving those really big issues we're facing much faster and in a much more open way. Yeah, that's that's true. I completely agree with you. Um, so as uh, I, I guess as last uh, question, I wanted to ask you what advice do you give to um, to our audience to uh, young professions or even people who are starting uh, learning programming how they navigate through this uh, through the tech world I know that sometimes it can be intimidating for people who are um, who are not who don't uh, who, uh, who doesn't have the background uh, and uh, it just uh, you know um, uh, uh, holding them back to step up in this world what what advices do you give to them 
Well, first of all, it's never too late to learn. So if I look at Kodam, we get uh, people that come from uh, that, and reskilling is it, something that, that's very important to them. There are a lot of ways of learning. I would say to people, invest in yourself. It's not, it's not too late to learn. Try to have a look at the, the areas that, that you're interested in. I'm always a great big believer that if you do something that you believe in or you work for a company that does something you believe in or with a team which you get the energy because there is a good team dynamic, that, that's, that's the first thing. So I would say try it and learn a lot about yourself. Uh, not easy when you're 20. You uh, accept that you actually don't know much about yourself. Try to analyze uh, when you've had a good day, uh, when you've had a bad day, uh, what the thing you really, the type of people you really want to work with and you really don't want to work with. And try to have this as a, a bit as a northern stars of where you want to go. And as of technologies, as far as technology is concerned, there are a lot of uh, courses out there some co like Kodam, which is a bit long, two or three years, but you also have boot camps. Just try to uh, keep yourself current. Don't uh, hesitate to invest in yourself and your knowledge if you join, if you want to go into, into the technology field. The, it is unlikely you will not find a job if you're in technology. Uh, we have crying out for people, uh, the shortage of software engineers, data scientists, uh, but also marketeer, online marketers and growth hackers. And if you look at the whole technology spectrum, it's huge. So I would advise people to, to look in this area, talk to people who are doing those jobs. Some of those jobs didn't exist five years ago. So it's very difficult to, to know. So I would advise to find people on LinkedIn uh, or find mentoring platform, uh, people say, hey, what it is that you do, I've looked at it, it sounds really interesting, can you tell me more? So uh, be bold, uh, try to engage, talk to people, and uh, try to get a good idea of, the, of, of all the opportunities that are out there. There are many, there are many jobs, there are many opportunities to change the world a little bit in an area that you're passionate about. Just go for it. Yeah, that's uh, actually I can I totally relate to that. I think I've, I've known most of the people who are uh, who helped me actually in my career in my education in in uh, in, in places that I've never thought of, about the event that I hesitated to go a community that I hesitated to contribute. So that's actually true that you you, you see the opportunities where you never imagined that you um, you were going to just jump from there. That's that's uh, I, I totally relate to that. Um, I want to just check. More, uh, Next time I need to interview you. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that would be my honor. <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to talk long, so uh, you have to stop me then. Maybe 30 minutes is not, not going to be enough for, the, for that interview. Um, so I'm going to just check if we have um, any questions left. Um, uh, otherwise, then we can, um, yeah. Uh, so basically, we have, a, um, uh, we have platforms that if people can ask questions, then if it's okay, then uh, if there are questions, then I can uh, ask you briefly um, if uh, there are, then, then we can, um, you can, you can answer send them, them to later. me and then we can, we can do it. And next yeah, time, of I course. You. Okay, okay. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, yeah, I will keep, in, uh, keep that in mind. Thank you so much, Corinne, for joining us. It was uh, an honor to talk to you and to have you here. Thank you so much again. Take care, everyone. Good luck. Bye-bye. And uh, I will give the stage to um, uh, our other host and our other speaker. Enjoy.